The producer's purpose is to suggest some possible explanations, but not necessarily the only ones, to the mysteries we will examine. December 15th, 1944, Bedfordshire, England. Glenn Miller, the most popular musician in the world, is serving as commander of the Army Air Corps Band. Determined to fly to France to prepare for a concert, he accepts an invitation to make the journey in a small plane. Poor weather has already delayed the flight for several days. Despite personal misgivings, he is unwilling to wait any longer. Contact with the plane lasts only a few minutes. Glenn Miller will never be seen again. It has long been believed the plane iced up and went down in the English Channel. Yet recent information raises some disturbing questions. What were the circumstances around the disappearance? And why was there never a search made for the aircraft? After nearly four decades, is it possible the wreck of that plane can be found today? The Battle of Britain brought aerial warfare into the lives of every citizen of England. For six years, countless forays were flown, and always death was in the sky. Children Hills near London. During World War II, pilots called this area the graveyard. Hundreds of planes shot from the skies over Great Britain crashed here. Today, relics of those planes are being excavated. Parts of American P-38s, British Spitfires and German Messerschmitts are found regularly. One plane that left from this airfield is sought more than any other. Finding the remains of this plane will explain the mystery that clouds the life of a man who stood for an era, Glenn Miller. An entire generation grew up idolizing Glenn Miller. America's youth danced, romanced, and marched off to war to the beat of his music. Glenn Miller was an unlikely Pied Piper. He was a perfectionist, moody, aloof, a loner. He remained a mystery man to even his closest band members. In 1942, he shocked everyone with a fateful decision. On September 27th, 1942, at the Central Theater in Passaic, New Jersey, Glenn Miller announced that he would disband his orchestra and volunteer for the American war effort. Many believe that this move, more than any other, marked the beginning of the end of the big band era. He became Major Glenn Miller, leader of the Army Air Corps Band. 
he and the military were at odds over jazz innovations he wanted to make in traditional military music. After more than a year of heated confrontations, the generals gave in. Military music would never be the same. By 1944, he was stationed in England. Even the luxury of staying here at Milton Ernest Hall had paled for Miller. On the morning of December 15, 1944, as recreated here, he left for France with Colonel Norman Bissell. Miller had promised American GIs a Christmas concert from Paris. Bissell arranged for him to travel ahead of the band in a small plane. Miller knew the flight would be hazardous. Poor weather had already delayed it for several days, and now flying conditions were marginal at best. Miller was undergoing the worst period of his life. During the Blitz of London, he had spent night after night huddled in air raid shelters. His battle with the military to change Air Corps music had taken a toll on his health. He had lost nearly 20 pounds. He was tired and depressed. Friends say Miller had an exaggerated fear of flying. It's always been a mystery why he risked this particular flight. Is it possible that his wartime experiences, his deteriorating health and constant pressure caused him to make an irrational decision? Don Haynes, the band's administrative officer, drove Miller and Bissell to the airport. He later reported that Miller asked, where are the parachutes? Bissell answered, what's the matter, Miller? You want to live forever? <laughs> Haynes was to follow later that week with the band. What happened during the next hour of flight would produce tragedy and controversy. Military sources claim the plane went down in the English Channel, yet conflicting reports concerning this doomed flight continue to cause debate. Something different had happened to Glenn, something which was... Herb Miller, Glenn's brother, doubts the official explanation. What we were told, I feel that we were fed a story and that we were uh, completely misled. I have here a missing aircraft report. All kinds of things on here are irregular. The inquiry was uh, not properly handled. As a matter of fact, there was no search and no officer in charge of this search. Throughout the years, the Glenn Miller mystery has thrived on half-truths and innuendo much of which was unwittingly brought about by a lack of effort on the part of authorities to find the plane. Let's examine what steps were taken after it disappeared. These previously classified papers have never been publicized before. They are the Air Force official reports on the incident. The most curious aspect of these papers are the dates on them. Miller's plane was not officially confirmed as missing until the 20th of December, five days after the takeoff. He said, Al? Yet Alan Stilwell, Miller's civilian valet, recalls that military police didn't wait five days. It might have been one day, two days, but two security officers came and put strapping over his belongings and sealed it, and then they were transported away. And that was the last I saw or heard of anything of him. Investigators have always been puzzled by this move. Officials claim this action was taken to protect Miller's belongings. Yet his family reports never receiving them. 
nor, as often happens in wartime, were they shared amongst his comrades. It was certainly against normal practice to remove a man's personal effects before his death was confirmed or before he had been missing a full week. This incident led some to believe the military was holding back information. Official air crew reports were to be compiled within 48 hours of the time an air crew member was reported missing. Yet this report was not completed till the 23rd of December, eight days after the doomed flight. Why the delay? Other questions are left unanswered by the report. Why wasn't there an extensive search for the plane, especially when the disappearance concerned a world-famous celebrity? Radar antennas that searched the skies over the English Channel never detected the plane. Many of the rumors surrounding the disappearance of Glenn Miller's plane could have been silenced by the findings of a court of inquiry. Yet no official investigation was ever made. The question is, why? December 15, 1944. In Search Of examines the circumstances of that day. What we do know for sure is that Glenn Miller's plane took off and was never seen again. Any thorough investigation of the Miller mystery must start with the military and its lack of effort to search for the plane. We have assembled participants as well as investigators. Royal Fry, curator of the United States Air Force Museum, Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, Ohio. You know, as much has been made of this in the past, the idea of having a military court of inquiry, but we had fellows who disappeared on flights every day. Uh, I had a very good friend disappear on a flight out of my squadron. We were flying fighters. I remember another instance where we had a major takeoff on, uh, on a flight five min minutes after the squadron had headed out. He should have done it. He disappeared, never came back. Uh, at that time, the Battle of the Bulge had just started, or started a couple of days afterwards. Uh, the Germans were marching through Western Europe. We had to worry about that. Every day that we sent missions out, there were Americans who didn't come back. Every bomber that went down had 10 Americans on board. And although I don't personally believe this, you know, I don't feel this in my own heart because I'm, I've always been a Miller buff. But let's face it realistically. That airplane disappeared with three men on board. A flight officer who was the lowest ranking pilot you could have, a lieutenant colonel who was not a pilot, we called them ground pounders, how valuable he was to the war effort, I don't know, and a third fellow on there, a major who played a trombone. Now that's cold-blooded, but you have to look at it in the context of the time. I don't imagine they sent out search aircraft. I imagine the search consisted of checking with air bases and checking with uh, ground observer corps, checking with radar sites, checking with possible places they may have landed and failed to report in. But I don't think they launched any sort of a large search like they did for Amelia Earhart back in the mid-1930s. Again, they had a war to fight. And every airplane and boat they used for search was one they didn't use to fight the Germans. What did happen to Glenn Miller? The more we uncovered, the more complex his story became. Some friends claim that after Miller joined the service, he became fatalistic. Legendary tenor sax man and vocalist for Miller's civilian band, Tex Beneke, explains what England was like when Miller arrived in 1944. And this was about the time that the uh, Germans were throwing so many of those buzz bombs at, uh, at London and cities all around that he was scared. He was scared to death of those uh, V-bombs. But he did get the band out of Bedford, England just a day before the whole town was obliterated. And uh, he actually felt at that time, according to some of the boys that were with him, that he would never get back. One chilling indication of Miller's fatalism was sent to his brother. Two weeks or so before he disappeared, he wrote a letter to his brother Herb in California. And on the back page of that two-page letter, he wrote, By the time you receive this, we shall all be in Paris barring, of course, a nosedive into the channel. And it almost brings the hair up in the nape of your neck to stand there and read that letter and realize this was written by the great Glenn Miller and he apparently did nosedive into the channel. 
Finding the remains of the aircraft would begin to answer some of the questions surrounding the Glenn Miller mystery. Two key participants in the flight itself were never even questioned by the military. Arnold Bruns was the aircraft's maintenance crew chief on that day in December 1944. In search of found Bruns living today in Manawa, Wisconsin. He recalls pre-flighting Miller's aircraft with its pilot, John Morgan. Mr. Morgan and I went over the uh, maintenance forms on the aircraft. We pre-flighted the aircraft. We found everything to be very much uh, tip-top as far as the maintenance portion of the aircraft was concerned. We checked out the anti-icing and de-icing equipment to the best of my knowledge, and it was well equipped with that phase of equipment. And I'm sure that had the uh, aircraft encountered icing, the capabilities of uh, Mr. Morgan were such that he definitely would have taken evasive action immediately, or had he started to cross the channel under icing conditions and found that they did exist, he definitely would have turned back to base. Despite Mr. Brun's claim, some officials say the plane was not equipped with de-icing gear. Until the plane is found, we may never know if such equipment was aboard. Dixie Clerk was the radio operator at Twin Woods Field who cleared Miller's plane for takeoff. She now resides in Surrey, British Columbia. Mrs. Clerk remembers that shortly after the plane took off, it was not responding to radio calls from the airfield. Uh, I figured at the time, well, there has to be one or two things. Either the radio's gone out or they've gone down. Uh, but generally, well, if the, the radio had gone out, the pilot wouldn't have continued not to go over the drink with such a, an important person as, as Benuela on it. I called several places, including Coastal Command and uh, places like that, to see if any of them had heard about the echo, and they said no. And from then on in, as far as I was concerned, I assumed, and I've always assumed, they went down on land. They, they had to have gone down on land. I can't see how anybody can think any different because they didn't clear the circuit. They had to have gone down on that. Now, since then, I've learned how rugged the Chilton Hills are, and I've also been told that uh, several aircraft have gone down in the Chilton Hills that they've never found. I figure if they have to search once, twice, three times, even a dozen times and they don't find it, I still think that in the end, that's where they're going to find the aircraft. Could the plane lie buried somewhere in the Chiltern Hills? There is one unconfirmed report. A farmer in this area told officials he heard a plane crash after Miller's plane took off. Miller would have flown southward over this area and route to France. Could wreckage of the Miller aircraft still be found here? The Children Aircraft Group is a body of aviation enthusiasts who spend their weekends digging up wrecks of aircraft that crashed in the hills. Their leader is Peter Halliday. Around the Chilton area is a, a real burial ground of crashed aircraft. Many of them weren't recovered during the war and were buried in the ground. And this is what our group is actively doing at the moment, is recovering the ones that were never recovered. Um, we have a large number, I should think. The last count we had about 120 in the Buckinghamshire area, which does cover the Chilton area. Um, this one, for example, um, was dug up from about 16 feet into the ground after 34 years in the ground. It crashed in 1941. Every week, airplane parts are dug up in the children's. Pieces to puzzles that have remained unsolved for nearly four decades. In light of the growing belief that Miller's plane crashed on land, these airplane archaeologists may soon uncover the final fate of the great band leader. Twin Woods Airfield today. The answer to the Miller mystery lies somewhere between here and Paris.
Once, this field echoed with the roar of Spitfire fighters and the cadence of marching troops. Thousands of men departed from here for the battlefields of Europe. Many of these men were touched by the music and the memory of a fellow soldier who never returned. There were millions of casualties during World War II. Every death affected someone. One, two. But the disappearance of Glenn Miller affected us all. It ended an era. Next, 20th Century with Mike Wallace looks at the attack on the cruise ship Achille Lauro and other terrorist acts against Americans. Then Weapons at War takes you into battle with combat engineers. And log on at Veterans.com, a new website brought to you by the History Channel. Veterans.com, a place where veterans, their families, and others can connect, share stories, and pass on the legacies of all American veterans.